Now we are going to describe briefly the bones of the lower limb, starting by the hip bone. The hip bone at the early development in childhood will be formed of three parts. The ilium, which is the large part, the upper part, the ischium, the lower and posterior part, and the ilium, and the pubis, which is the anterior part. So it's formed of three bones, the ilium, superiorly, the ischium, posteriorly, and the pubis, anteriorly. They meet together at the estabulum. The pubis will form one-fifth of that cavity, while the ilium and the ischium, each one of them will form two-fifths of that cavity of the estabulum. In a childhood, they are separate from each other, as you can see here. But here it is fused. The arch is formed by the pubis or pubic arch and mainly by the ischial arch. That is the pubic arch here. That is the point of meeting over here. And they will come one bone, they fuse together around the age of seven to eight years. While the stapulum will fuse at the age of 14, 16 in the female or 16, 18 in the male. That is the fusion of the stapulum and the fusion of the pubis. Each one will develop from a separate center and that's how it looks like in childhood. That is the ilium now. We are going to start the, that is the adult hip bone or what we call the innominate bone. As you can see, it has an outer surface looking from outside and inner surface here. The outer surface will start by the ilium. Its outer surface is what called the gluteal surface. The inner has two surfaces the iliac fossa and the sacro-pelvic surface. So these are the three surfaces of the ilium. The ilium has an upper border, which we call it the iliac crest, an anterior border, a posterior border, and medial border, that is the medial border starting from this point to that point here, that is the medial border, which separates the iliac fossa from the sacro-pelvic surface. When it comes to the iliac crest, the upper border, usually it is divided into anterior two-thirds, and posterior one-third. The anterior two-third have an outer and inner borders or lips and intermediate line, that is the anterior two-third. While the posterior one-third have two surfaces, an inner surface and outer surface. That is the posterior one-third. That is the outer surface here. And that is the inner surface of the posterior one-third. On the anterior two-thirds, outside the outer border, 
there is what called the cuprosity of the iliac crust, which will give attachment to the tensor fascia lata over here. And the outer border will be the one in this part here, separating that tuberosity to be on the outer lip or outer side of the iliac crust. The attachments to the iliac crest are mainly to the anterior abdominal wall, the external oblique, the internal oblique, and the transverse abdominus. And then in the outer lip here, the dorsalis, the latissimus dorsi will be here. The outer surface of the posterior third will be for the gluteus maximus, while the inner surface will be the, for the erector spinalis muscle on this part here. The gluteal surface have three lines, the posterior gluteal line, the anterior gluteal line, and the inferior gluteal line, that is the inferior one, the anterior, and the posterior, separating the areas of the gluteal region for the gluteus maximus, which will be with the outer surface here, the gluteus medius between the anterior and the posterior, the gluteus minimus over here, below the inferior gluteal line, an impression for one of the heads, which is the reflected head of the rectus femoris muscle. That is the gluteal surface. The iliac fossa, which is the inner surface now, will give origin to the iliacus muscle. That is the sacro-pelvic surface here which is divided into two parts, as we said, a sacral part and pelvic part. And by the way, all the surfaces of the three bones here are named pelvic. So this is the pelvic surface of the ilium, pelvic surface of the pubis, pelvic surface of the ischium, because they will form the part which we call it the lesser pelvis. So all of them are pelvic surfaces. The pelvic surface of the ilium will share in the origin of the obturator internus here. The sacral part is divided in two parts, as you can see here. That is what we call it the auricular surface or the articular surface, the L-shaped one here. It articulates with the sacrum, forming part of the sacroiliac joint, the synovial part. And this is what called the iliac tuberosity in the rough part here, which again will articulate with the sacrum, forming a fibrous joint. So there is an interosseous ligament here connecting the tuberosity with the sacrum. The other ligaments will be the anterior, the middle, which is the interosseous, and the posterior sacroiliac ligaments. That is the part which you call it the sacral part. The Medial border here is divided into two parts, articular and arcuit part, arcuit line here. This arcuit line will end by the iliobectinial eminence, that is the bubis here, that is the bectinial surface, so this we call it the iliobectinial eminence. You can see the line of fusion between the pubis and the ilium very clear here. That is the medial border 
and the medial surface. The anterior border have two spines along that border, the anterior superior and the anterior inferior iliac spines. While the posterior border have also two spines, the posterior superior and posterior inferior iliac spines, they are clear here, posterior superior and posterior inferior. Both of them will give attachment to the sacrotuberous ligament, both the posterior superior and inferior. While the anterior superior iliac spine will give attachment to a ligament and muscle, the same thing for the posterior, for the anterior inferior iliac spine, a ligament and muscle. Here is attached the lateral end of the inguinal ligament and the sartorius muscle fluid. And here will be the iliofemoral ligament and the straight head of rectus femoris attached to the anterior inferior leg spine. So here is the inguinal and the sartorius. Here is the iliofemoral and the straight head of rectus femoris. And this covers most of or a brief on the ilium. The second bone, let's describe the pubic bone. The pubic bone is formed of a body, as you can see here, and superior ramus and inferior ramus, which will meet the ischial ramus forming the side of the pubic arch. So we have a body, superior and inferior ramus. The body here can show the medial surface or what call it the pelvic surface, that is the inner one, and symphysial surface, which can be the medial one, and this one will be the pelvic or the inner surface, and this is the outer or the femoral surface. Again, this will be the femoral surface of the ischium here. So we've got a femoral, a symphysial, and the pelvic surfaces, or outer, inner, and medial. The body has an upper border, which you call it the pubic crest, the upper border. And it has a lower border, which you go with the lower border of the pubic arch, and it has another lateral border which will form part of the obturator foramen. Lateral to the pubic crest, the upper border, that tubercle here, which is called the pubic tubercle, it is on the lateral side of the pubic crest. For the body, it gives origin to a ductor longus just below the pubic tubercle. And that is a very important landmark to identify or to feel the pubic tubercle in a patient, in a living person, by following the tendon of the ductor longus, which will be the most bulging tendon when the thigh is abducted against the distance, the bony eminence above that uh, tendon will be the pubic tubercle. So it will give organ origin to the adductor longus here, and then the adductor brevis will start to take from the body and the ramus, and the gracilis muscle will be attached to the body and the ramus. The inner surface of the body will give origin to the obturator internus and the levator eye on the inner surface. It's important to identify the surfaces and borders of the superior pubic arch. 
while the inferior pubic arch symbol it has an outer surface and inner surface and two borders upper border and lower border which will be continuous with the lower border of the ischium the upper border will continue to form part of the obturator foramen here the borders and the surfaces of the superior pubic ramus are the bactinian line which is continuous with the arcuate line here as a part of the boundary of the inlet of the true pelvis so that is the bactinian line and inferior border which complete the foramen the obturator foramen and what to call it obturator crest so the three borders are a bactinian line an inferior border and obturator crest we'll see it in next slide more clearly than that the surfaces are the bactinian surface which is this one here and the pelvic surface and the obturator surface here which is bounded by what to call it the obturator crest so that is the obturator crest the bactinian line and the inferior border the surfaces are the bactinian the pelvic and the obturator which actually will form the obturator canal let us see it in next diagram this obturator that is another view showing the parts of the superior cremus here it's clear that this is the what call it the obturator crest that is the what call it the bactinian line and this is the inferior border here <clears throat> so these are the three borders of the superior bibacramus the surfaces are the bactinial surface the obturator surface and the other side would be the pelvic surface attached to the bactinial line will be the bactinial ligament and the lacunar ligament and here we can see the pubic tubercle bulging over here which give attachment to the medial end of the inguinal ligament from the anterior superior leg spine to the pubic tubercle the lateral fibers reflected on the bactinal line from the inguinal ligament which we call it the lacunar ligament the bactinius muscle will take origin from the bactinial surface and the bactinial line also. The obturator surface will be lodging, as we said, the structures in the obturator canal, the obturator nerve and vessels. Or the pelvic surface will be the obturator internus attached to the inner surface or pelvic surface of the superior biocremus. Now, this is the last bone which you call it the ischium form it of a body and one ramus here so that is the body and this is the ramus the body have a dorsal surface or posterior surface a femoral surface and pelvic surface these are the surfaces of the body the body carries what call it the ischial tuberosity over here and the ischial spine here that is the groove for the tendon of the obturator internus on the dorsal surface of the of the body the ischial spine will give attachment to the sacrospinous ligament from the outer surface from the pelvic surface 
it will give attachment to the levator ni and the coccygeus muscle. This tuberosity, the sacral tuberosity, is divided by a horizontal line into upper area and lower area. The upper area is redivided by an oblique line to upper lateral and lower medial parts. The upper lateral will give origin to the semimembranosis, the lower medial to the semitendinosis and the long head of biceps femoris. The lower area is divided by a horizontal line or it is almost vertical and then horizontal into two areas, a lateral area and medial area. The lateral area will give origin to part of the abductor magnus, the ischial part. The pubic part will come from the side of the pubic arch here. While the medial part is the area of sitting and it is surrounded by fatty tissue and fibrous tissue and that's where we are sitting. The tuberosity have a lateral lip and medial lip, that is the medial lip here and that is the lateral lip. The lateral lip will give origin to the quadratus femoris muscle, while the medial lip will give attachment to the sacrotuberous ligament with extension which is called the falciform uh, extension, falciform ligament here, extension from the sacrotuberous ligament. That is the body of the ischium. The inner surface will give birth to the origin of the obturator internus. That is a summary of the hip bone, a very brief summary on the bone itself. Now we are going to describe again a summary of the other bone which is the femur and we'll concentrate on the upper part of it which will help to understand the upper part of the thigh. That is the femur bone, the front and the back, as seen from the front and back. It's formed of the head, which is semi-hemisphere, articulating with the articular surface of the stapulum to form the hip joint. In the middle of the femur, looking to the medial side, there is a fovea on the head, which give attachment to the ligamentum teres or the round ligament of the head of the femur, which transmits, that ligament transmit a nutrient artery to the head of the femur. And this is a very important artery in a childhood and even at birth, because the head is separate from the neck by hyaline cartilage, a piece of visual cartilage here, which does not allow the passage of the blood vessels through it. So the head depends completely on that artery coming through the ligamentum teres. During delivery, injury of that ligament can occur with interruption of the blood supply to the head of the femur which will be absorbed and this is what call it birth disease and would lead to limbing of the child so that the head and a neck that is the neck of the femur 
which will meet with this, the shaft anteriorly by the intertrochanteric line here. That is the intertrochanteric line. And you'll see posteriorly the intertrochanteric crest. This is the lesser trochanter, which will give attachment to the iliopsoas muscle. And that is the greater trochanter of the femur, which have a, a number of muscles attached to it, mainly insertion. The lower end have a medial condyle and lateral condyle. These are the two condyles of the femur. On the back, that is the intertrochanteric crest. In the middle of that crest, there is what call it the quadrate tubercle which will give insertion to the quadratus femoris. Below the crest, that is what we call it the spiral line, which is a continuation of the intertrochanteric line here. It will continue as the spiral line, which will continue down to the, be the median lip of the linea aspera. That is the linear aspra here. So the intertrochanteric line will continue at the spiral line, and the spiral line will be continued downwards at the medial level of the linear aspra. The lateral level of the linear aspra upwards will be continuous with what we call it the gluteal tuberosity here. That is the gluteal tuberosity. Below will be continuous that lateral lip with the lateral supracondylar ridge while the medial lip will be continuous with the medial supracondylar ridge. Between the spiral line and the gluteal tuberosity, this part we call it the bictinial surface, which have a line from the lesser trochanter to the upper end of the linea aspera, which call it bictinian line, down between the lateral supracondylar ridge and the medial supracondylar ridge is the popliteal surface of the femur here, that is on the posterior aspect, what we call it the popliteal surface, and this is what we call it the bictinian surface. Between the two condyles of the femur at the lower end is the intercondylar area which will give attachment to the two crochet ligaments as we will know. Above the medial condyle this is what we call it the adductor tubercle which will give attachment to the adductor magnus. That is a description of the anterior surface, which have at its lower end the area for the patella here, and the posterior surface of the femur. Here is the upper end of the femur, which we are going to describe its attachments. We have the head again, as we said, with this fovea, which give attachment to the ligamentum teres, which transmit the important artery, which is a branch from the obturator artery. Then the neck. The neck is completely intercapsular anteriorly, but posteriorly it is, its middle is intercapsular, and the other middle is extra capsule because the fibrous capsule is attached to the middle of the neck here. 
reflection from the inner aspect of the capsule of the hip joint which is attached to the intertrochanteric line here those reflected fibers on the neck is what we call it the fibrous retinacula which surround the neck of the fibula completely forming a circle around it carrying the blood supply to the neck of the femur you can see here a lot of numbers of nutrient foramina here these are the places where the arteries are supplying the neck moreover this retinacula surround the neck will help in keeping the parts of the fractured neck if it is fractured in position to help in rapid repair and fusion of the neck that is the neck of the femur here is the lesser trochanter which you said it would be giving insertion to the psoas major above and the iliacus below which will take part of the shaft with one tendon which we call it the iliopsoas tendon will be attached to the lesser trochanter here is the greater trochanter the large one it gives insertion it from its anterior surface to the gluteus minimus an oblique ridge on the lateral surface will give insertion to the gluteus medius up to the tip of that greater trochanter on the back will be the gluteus maximus extending to the gluteal tuberosity in the anterior part of the intertrochanteric line the lower part will give origin to the vastus medialis which will continue with the spiral line down to the linea aspera the upper part with the root of the greater trochanter will give origin to the vastus lateralis which will continue from the root to the lateral lip of the linea aspera that is the vastus lateralis over here origin on the medial aspect of the greater trochanter there is the trochanteric fossa here in the fossa will be the insertion of the obturator externus internal inside the fossa outside the fossa a ridge or an area for the insertion of the obturator internus on the quadrate that is the intertrochanteric line here that is the intertrochanteric crest which we have seen and on that there is the quadrate tubercle for the insertion of the quadratus femoris that is the gluteal tuberosity which give insertion to the deep quarter of the gluteus maximus the superficial three quarters of that muscle will be inserted in the iliotibial tract and that is the spiral line which is a continuation of the intertrochanteric line above and the medial lip of linea aspera below that is the bictinial line dividing the bictinial surface here the upper two thirds of the anterior part of the bictinial line will give insertion to the bictinius while the lower two thirds of the bictinial line with the upper part of the linea aspera will be the insertion of the adductor longus that's part 
of the femur, the upper end of the femur.